LTJ Bookham's seminal 1993 release has been played, sampled and remixed to death in the 30 years since its original release. But how would you feel if you found out that the most iconic part of this track is lifted directly from another tune? Is this stealing or just good sampling? Is Bookham really a musical thief? So let's take a closer look at exactly how the whole track was made to find out. So before we dive into that iconic sound, let's quickly look at the intro sample, the vocal, the bass and the drums. So the track starts with this lovely sample, which I managed to find, but I still don't know what it is. As I was digging, I came across this free sample pack from some of my favorite drum and bass producers of all time, Blue Martin. It's a treasure trove of samples used in classic drum and bass tracks. And as they say, these are all samples from commercially released tracks. Use them in your productions at your own risk. So that's why, even if I did know, I wouldn't tell you where it was from. It's like the producer's code. <laughs> so I never want to get any producers in trouble. I'm pro sampling, but I only want to reveal things that it's like okay to reveal. So I got the sample from this sample pack. I whacked it into Tail Sampler and I actually created two layers to create the kind of way it overlaps. So let's just listen to that. As far as effects go, just a bit of delay. It's kind of like a quarter note, I suppose. Next up, we have the vocal. And then this bit. Now, a lot of you might know this, but I actually never knew where this was from, even though I actually made a tune with it in. This might actually be one of the most widely sampled acapellas ever from a track called Sanctuary of Love. So what do NWA, The Prodigy, and countless drum and bass classics have in common? Of course, it's the Amen Break. It's a drum sample that's as essential to Jungle as Mitsubishi's are to uh, drivers. Here it's mainly looped. It's fairly simple. So I've actually used, I think, from Zero G data file. Got a bit of processing. Yeah, I've made it quite trashy actually. The original sounds like this. So if I just turn on the effects one by one, bit of saturation, bit of sample grit. That's from this plugin, Sample X3. EQ, you can kind of see what I'm doing, boosting a lot of the high end. And if I just play the original for a sec, it's pretty close, I'd say. That's pretty much it. There's no real layering of like the kicks and the snares or anything as far as I can tell, but there are some little fills. Here's an example of one of them. In the original, sounds like this. I think I've taken the wrong sample. I'm not actually 100% sure that it's from the Amen Break. As an example of how to do it, I just took the drum loop, chopped it, chopped out individual hits. I think it's that one actually. Little bit different pitch. I think that's it. I think I've just done it. And that's a really nice little technique. If you've just got a drum break going, you can actually add some hits and you can extend it, make it more interesting. Whereas if you've just got a one bar loop, it's always just gonna be a one bar loop. There's a bass sound that's synonymous with the whole kind of good looking, intelligent jungle scene. And it doesn't come from a synth per se, so much as from a classic drum machine or maybe a sample pack. So here's the sound. <laughs> And of course, it's an 808 kick. Yeah, not too much to say about that. I just used the one I had. And this is actually from Ableton itself, from the core library, kick sub 808 long C1. I'm 
Sounds bang on to me. So just before we see about this sample theft, we've just got one more little thing, which is the bongos. And this actually reveals a nice little production technique that quite a lot of people tend to ignore. This is the sample from the abyss. It seems to me quite clear that they've been played in. It's quite often tempting, you know, we just put in notes with the mouse and there's something not very musical about it. Of course I do it sometimes, but sometimes it's really nice to actually just play things in. So this is actually quite tricky to do. So the way I did it, and another nice little technique, is I just slowed it down. So that I could copy the pattern and then I sped it back up. I just want to say a quick word about my Patreon. There's loads more going on these days. One of the main things for the higher tiers is uh, production tuition basically and in the form of challenges. Every month I'm going to challenge you to do something and the first one is to make a beat. I've got a tutorial like a walkthrough of how just how to make a beat. It might sound simple but I think it's something that's really good to focus on. This is the introduction to it and I've also got some some more advice written down. So basically there's loads more going on. I've got behind the scenes footage of when I've been making the videos. I've also got a podcast and you can listen to that on Spotify. Basically I'm much more active. I'm really excited for it. So check it out. Okay, this is the bit that to me is just, it's got a magic to it. I don't know, sometimes things get created which are just higher or more, or I don't know what. This sound just, it's just so amazing. And yes, it's completely ripped from another track. The track's called Circuit and it's by Real by Real which is an alias of Martin Bonds who's actually a classic Detroit techno guy. The original track, we put it back down to 126. <laughs> if we just play a bit more. So there are two big questions for me. One, is this okay? Is this stealing or is this just normal sampling? And two, if Bookham just got it from a sample, how was it made originally? So let's look at the first point. For me, this is really complicated. Do I think that Martin Bonds should have some recognition and maybe financial reward for basically creating the foundation of this track? Yeah, you could say I do. But then you might argue that it wouldn't have been heard by so many people if it hadn't been used in this track. The thing is, is sampling is fundamental to modern dance music, from hip hop to jungle. And I actually think one of the reasons why there aren't as many classic tunes coming out now as there used to be is that people are afraid to use samples from other records. So this is maybe a bit controversial. A lot of people you go onto a forum and talk about, ask about sampling and people are like, it's stealing, it's evil, just do your own music. But I don't agree with this at all. I think sampling is a creative art and I think there's a lot of music that demonstrates that. Of course, if you just take a famous disco tune and put a 4-4 kick behind it, yeah, I don't consider that to be particularly creative. But even the recontextualizing of something, like even the example here of taking a part of a track with two sounds and then going somewhere else with it. To me, it's valid. Like, I love this track. I actually don't particularly love the original. It doesn't do it for me. Like, no disrespect at all. But I love this one. So is it right? Is it wrong? Really, what do you think? Let me know in the comments. But personally, I'm pro sampling and I actually think people should do it maybe more. We're in a weird position now where you can get almost infinite sounds from Splice and Loop Cloud and places like that. And now you're already seeing copyright claims from people who use something from Splice and it's like someone else uses it after them, but it's meant to be royalty free. So how does that work? Also, people don't get money from tunes anymore. You know, you get a tiny bit from streaming, but basically there's not the money that there used to be, which is what made the lawyers get involved when sampling blew up. So from my point of view, I'm thinking maybe I'll just sample other records because there's something about the texture, about the musicality that went into those things. I think it can just take your track to a higher level. I'm not telling you to do anything illegal. 
but I'm telling you this is something I'm quite passionate about and this is something that I want to pursue in my production so let me know what you think in the comments so the second important thing is how did Martin Bonds make this? Yeah, this led me on quite a journey. So there's two parts of it. There's the pad sound and the, the main melody sound. And the pad, I could kind of get close with the DX7. It's just quite simple. It's fifths. So it's just a basic chord, well, with two note chord, G sharp, uh, C sharp, and then F sharp. So th the key will be slightly off because of, I needed to do it differently for the speed, but this is basically it. So I could get that without too much difficulty, but the other sound, I tried really hard. This is kind of an attempt. And there's just something about the sound. I went on gear space. Actually, the first answer was a Kawai K1, bit of back and forth. Someone came in and they started saying, talking about this Kawai K4. And then someone with that synth, this guy, Rasaru, was very kind and he tried to make something similar. And that this convinced me that it was from that synth. So if you just listen to this. So obviously it's not that close to the actual thing, but if we listen to the original. I think it's definitely from that synth. And so now I want a Kawai K4. So you can donate to my GoFundMe to help me buy one joke so there are a few little bits and bobs that i didn't get and i forgot to mention the pads one, which is just a fairly simple melody and i just used a sample for that Yeah, here there's a little FX sound that I couldn't find. And that got ahead, got ahead, couldn't find that. You can hear that little fill. It's a fairly simple tune really, fairly simple bass. I think the bass does change up actually a little bit. And then it changes to this. And then here, slightly different again. Because the pad changes up there. And then it just drops back into this uh, kit sample. And to be honest, the impression I get is that he wouldn't have spent like weeks and weeks on this. No disrespect at all, but I think Sometimes you just catch inspiration and you make something fairly quickly and, and you get something magical like this. So such an amazing track. Massive respect to LTJ Bookham, also to Martin Bonds. So if you're a DMB head, you'll be well aware of the re-space. But what was the first tune to use it and how? Check out this tune to find out. <laughs> 